take me back to the beginning, if you could, on how you became involved in ATIP and exactly how that came to be. Uh, how did I get involved? Um, let's rewind the clock to about 2008, and I'll give you kind of the, the synopsis of how all this evolved. Um, I was working uh, prior to that at the uh, Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Uh, I was a uh, senior intelligence officer working um, policy, strategy, things like that. And to be quite frankly, uh, frank with you, the, the, the drive was killing me. I was living on Maryland's Eastern Shore at the time, and you're looking at a three-hour commute one way. Um, I loved my job. I loved the people, but the commute was killing me. So uh, at the time, um, it was then Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, Jim Clapper, was over at the USDI, and he was the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence at the time, uh, and a man I, I respected greatly. And I was given an opportunity to come back to DOD for about a year um, to, to work some, some new efforts, particularly in intelligence sharing, law enforcement, information integration. And so I, I came back very eager because my, my daily commute was cut about in half all of a sudden, uh, and I had a uh, little bit more of my life back. So I went back to DOD, and it was at that time uh, I was working um, in the National Capital Region, NCR Region, where... Um, so people had come to my to my desk. We were working. I wasn't in the Pentagon at the time. We were working at a remote location, but still connected to the Pentagon. Um, and uh, you know, it's 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 kind of bizarre because like out of out of a movie, um, these two people. I still remember today very clearly from what they were wearing. Very nicely dressed. Uh, and um, I remember someone knocking on the door and said, Mr. Elizondo, there's there's some people here to see you, which was just not uncommon. You know, you, you're always working issues, so you're trying to fix things. Uh, so so sure, bring them on in. They came in. And uh, they said, hey, uh, you're, you're Luis Elizondo. And I said, yes, I am, Lou. Uh, can we talk to you? And I said, sure. And one of them shut the door behind them, my door. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> this is probably not good. You know, uh, I often joke, you know, what did I do now, right? Um, I, I probably upset somebody. And uh, they sat down and uh, they started to say, you know, hey, look, uh, we, we are part of the intelligence community. Uh, we're part of a program. We're not going to tell you much about it, but uh, do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? And uh, I, I probably was a little rude. I probably was a little bit standoffish because I don't particularly like talking about myself, especially if I don't know who you are. Um, and they start asking very pointed questions, so specifically about, you know, we hear that you're, you're, you're a counterintelligence guy. We hear that you did some background uh, before. You have some background uh, in advanced uh, avionics and aerospace industry. Uh, is that true? And yes, do you mind sharing with us? I said, well, I'll share with you at the unclassified level the type of systems I worked on, but I'm really not comfortable going into any more detail. And so long story short, they agreed to, to they would come back and have another discussion with me. Um, and so when they left, I ran some trap lines to find out that they were legit. They were part of a, a special program, but I, I didn't have clearance into it, so I really didn't know. But they really were who they said they were. They were part of a, a small organization and I presume that the time had something to do with aerospace, but I really didn't know. And then a uh, couple more trips, they came by, we talked, got a little bit more comfortable. They got more comfortable with me. I certainly got more comfortable with them. And finally, they said, we'd like to uh, have you meet our director. And I said, okay, sure, no problem. Uh, it might have been, John, probably seven or 10 days later, we, I had an appointment to go meet. The, I was hoping the director would come see me. Mm -hmm. I, I I thought I was sufficiently senior enough where, you know, you want to come see me, you can come see me. Instead, I, they're like, okay, be at this location at this time, at this place, and don't tell anybody you're coming. Uh, so, again, a little bit unusual. I'm like, you know, I'm sorry, who are you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I decided to go ahead and do it. And uh, I told my deputy at the time, hey, I'm going to go go to this meeting. Um, I went to it. And uh, it was at an undisclosed location in, in also the National Capital Region. Um, look a bit just like a normal office building, really, uh, until you go inside and then you realize that you have, you know, guards and whatnot. And you're like, okay, no, this is probably a little bit more, more sensitive. And I remember going up the elevator up to the floor and, uh, it looked like a, it looked like a, an office building you would see like on wall street, really, um, you know, cubicles all over the place and people kind of making copies and doing work diligently on, on their computers. And there was this corner office, um, kind of looked like a well, glass, you know, and the individual sitting back in there. And what struck me is that the individual was, I don't want to stereotype, but if you would ever think of what a rocket scientist looks like, he was your quintessential rocket scientist. Mm -hmm. Glasses, 
uh, you know, very, very look, look, appeared very astute um, and very no nonsense. Um, so I went, I, I introduced myself, shook his hand. Hey, glad you're here. He didn't smile. He was just very serious. And he was, man, he looked at me. He was staring at me. I, I felt almost a little uncomfortable because I know he was assessing the hell out of me. And I was trying to assess him as well. But obviously, he probably knew a little bit more about me than I knew about him. Uh, which is never really good to go into a meeting like that as an intelligence officer. You know, you kind of want to, if you will, know thy enemy. Uh, not saying he was my enemy by any stretch, but, you know, you want, want to know who you're dealing with. Uh, and he introduced himself. And um, I'm sure at some point his name will become become very public. I, I have, I have out of respect for him, I've never mentioned his name. Uh, he's asked me never to mention it uh, until he's comfortable with, with his name being out, so I won't. Um but we talked, we had a very good candid conversation. And that's when he asked me, I mean, he started, he started asking me about my background in, uh, in uh, aerospace and, and the type of technologies I worked on. And, um, you know, th this is a guy who I really, he knew his stuff. I mean, he was like literally a rock, literally by definition, a rocket scientist mm -hmm. and probably one of the best ones that we had in the government. Um, and that's when, you know, he asked me, he said, what do you, what do you think about, um, I, I man, it was, you know, John, he, he looked him straight in the face and looking back, it's, it's, it was so weird because I wasn't sure if he was like testing me or if it was legit, but he said, what do you think about the topic of UFOs? Now, coming from my world, you know, we'll, to test somebody, we will use provocative statements sometimes and then gauge their body language and, you know, micro behaviors and neuro linguistics mm -hmm. uh, to see if, you know, they're prone to, you know, flights of fancy and things like that, you know, and, uh, but he, he was, he was looking at me very serious. And I said, well, I, I, I don't really think about UFOs. And he says, what, you don't think they're real? I said, no, no, I didn't say that. I just, I never really had the luxury to think about UFOs. You know, I'm not particularly a, a huge science fiction fan. I, I never really watched X-Files or anything like that. Uh, and I've been so consumed with my work that when I'm not working, I'm at home uh, and I'm a father. But those are really the only things I ever have time for, work. And, and which didn't involve mm -hmm. anything at all involved with UFOs, clearly, and, um, and, and, and raising a family. So he said, okay, that's, that's fair. Um, and he said, but let me, let me uh, just caution you, let me caution you or warn you something to that effect. Let me caution you that um, don't let your analytic bias um, get in the way. And uh, he said, you're going you're gonna to see things that you may not, you may have a hard time reconciling. Now, at this mm -hmm. point, I hadn't even accepted it. I, didn't, I hadn't been offered even really a job, right? So yeah. I'm thinking to myself, are you, are you, is this a pitch? Are you offering me a job? Are this just, is this just advice for life you know, to take with me? And what, what the hell's really going on here? So uh, I nodded my head and said, no, well, you know, very, very fair point, right? Uh, I don't really have an opinion yet on it. And then we agreed, uh, had another conversation, but he said, look, I'm looking for a counterintelligence guy. Um, for, for those in your audience who may not know what really counterintelligence is, and a lot of people think they know what CI is. CI is, is really um, knowing what the enemy knows about you, right? So, so foreign intelligence collection is, is learning what the bad guys know. Counterintelligence is knowing what the bad guys know about you. So if you think of a chessboard, mm -hmm. um, if you are playing chess against an opponent, um, you know, foreign intelligence is knowing what their pieces can do on the chessboard and how they plan to move. Counterintelligence is knowing what they know about your pieces, right, and how you can move. So uh, it's it's yet another layer of of of, of playing chess to some degree, I guess. Um, you know, not, not any better or worse than mm -hmm. other forms of intelligence. It's just it's a very niche uh, way of doing business uh, from an intelligence perspective. So uh, he said, I'm looking for a counterintelligence guy um, because we know that there are some foreign countries, foreign adversaries out there that, that probably know what we're doing. And I, I need a good counterintelligence and security program, which, by the way, it's not unusual. Um, anytime you have a sensitive program, uh, you know, you want to have you want to have good security and counterintelligence expertise. It's just it's just an extra layer of, if you will, um, insurance mm -hmm. uh, to have to, to protect your program. So it wasn't unusual that I was that I was being asked to provide counterintelligence expertise. I wasn't being asked to do anything with UFOs per se. It was just to come in and provide, you know, the, the background that I already have, just use that in this capacity. So um, ultimately, long story short, obviously, the rest is history. Uh, no pun intended. I, 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 I 
I said, sure, I'll, 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 I'll accept the job. Um, and it was at that point, um, through, through various conversations afterwards, I began to realize that these guys are legit. They're real. I mean, they have like real data and, uh, the individuals that they started that were part of this effort, I knew from before, like people like Hal Pudoff and whatnot, that were, you know, they were kind of legends in their own time anyways. Um, so I knew this was a serious, legitimate effort. And then I began to see the documentation uh, from the Senate and Congress. And I, I really began to recognize that this was a full-fledged program, but they really did need counterintelligence expertise. They didn't have anything. So they were kind of, they were kind of vulnerable from that perspective.